Hello, everybody, and good evening. Welcome to our virtual lecture series. My name is Maria Jose Garcia Vizcaino. I am a professor of translation in the Spanish and Latino Studies Department at Montclair State University. And today's title of our lecture is Films for Biol, Accessible Filmmaking and Creative Accessibility. I cannot think of a better topic for this first lecture in the academic year than accessibility. Um, and I cannot think of a better representative of the field than Dr. Romero Fresco. So I want to thank him wholeheartedly for accepting our invitation. And I would like to thank you all for being here. I see uh, faces, uh, names of students, alumni, professors in our department, across the college in other departments, across campus, professional in the industry. So this is really exciting, exciting. And I don't want to just thank you for your presence, but also for your support, because the mere fact that you are here in this event means that you care about accessibility, which is an area that pertains and affects to all the disciplines. The timeline of the event is gonna be the following. First, I'm gonna give a, a short introduction of our speaker. Second, I will, uh, the speaker will be presenting uh, for 40, 45 minutes in English. Uh, we have captioning in English, uh, activated via Zoom, and Pablo, the speaker, will be providing audio description in English when needed, if there is uh, there are some images or visual input that are relevant for the presentation. Finally, right after the presentation, we will have a Q&A. Uh, we have our YouTube channel, so you may want to post your questions via the YouTube video, and also you can, in the chat, you can make your comments and questions, or you can raise your hands. Uh, you can post your questions in English and in Spanish, and we will translate them accordingly. Um, Pablo Romero Fresco is a Ramón y Cajal researcher at Universidad de Vigo, Spain, an honorary professor of translation and filmmaking at the University of Rockhampton, London, United Kingdom. He's, he's the author of the books Subtitling Through Speech Recognition, Free Speaking, published by Rodlich, Accessible Filmmaking, Integrating Translation into Accessibility into the Filmmaking Process, also by Rodlich, and one book with, which is forthcoming, and the title is Creativity in Media Accessibility. He's on the editorial board of the Journal of Audiovisual Translation, and he is the leader of the international research group GALMA, which stands for Galician Observatory for Media Access, for which he's currently coordinating several international projects on media accessibility and accessible filmmaking. Romero Fresco is also a filmmaker. His first short documentary, Joining the Dots, 2012, was released for the first time at the 69th Venice International Film Festival and was used by Netflix, as well as film schools around Europe to raise awareness about audio description. He has just released his first feature-length documentary, where memory ends, 2021, which has featured in El País and other leading Spanish media outlets, and now is being shown in movie theaters in Madrid. Congratulations, uh, Pablo, on that accomplishment. And I wanted to thank you uh, for accepting the invitation, and thank you particularly because you have been so accommodating. I have to say that Pablo is in Spain, so now it's uh, 11 p.m., 11.10, so yeah. thank, you, thank you so much for staying up for us and staying up so late and, and be so wonderful in that sense. And thank you so much for being here. So I think that without further ado, I will give you the floor. Thank you very much, Maria Jose. And thanks everyone for uh, the invitation. It's very exciting to, to be here and or to be here talking to you there. Um, and this is the, um, well, the talk for today is all about accessible for making and, and creative media accessibility. Um, I'm now seeing my presentation, no longer seeing you all, but hopefully I'll have a chat to exchange some views with you after the presentation, yeah? Um, so today, for today, I wanted to talk about these two issues, which are very related. Um, <clears throat> the first one is accessible for making. So we're looking at um, what happened with translation and accessibility. Um, and we're looking at uh, the separation and the reconciliation of translation and access with 
film production. We're looking at three shifts that are taking place in media accessibility. Um, and we're looking at uh, creative media accessibility and, and its political um, elements, if you like. So first of all, uh, now looking at the, I'm just, I'm just gonna try and see if I can uh, see this uh, screen. Just a second, see. Participants, because I'm only seeing myself, but anyway, well, it's okay, I can. Okay, so um, now, why do we talk about divorce? We talk about divorce because, first of all, what we have is we have um, a separation between the pre-production, production, and post-production of the filmmaking process, and then translation and accessibility happen at the distribution stage. Um, and this has always, well, it's not always, it's not always been the case, but it's mostly what, what's going on these days. Um, now, let me show you some figures of what the damage is. Um, if we look at the top grossing films in the first 17 years, and you could extend it to the 21st, 21st years of the 21st century, um, we're looking at, the, at a situation where most of these films um, made, uh, let's just say that 50% of the re revenue that they have, that they make, comes from the foreign versions of those films. We're looking at subtitle versions and dubbed versions, yes. Um, and yet, if I was to ask, you know, how much is spent on translation and on accessibility for those films, I don't know what percentage you would you would throw at me. I mean, it'd be good if you could write it in the chat, and then we can we can have a, have a look at it later. But it's something as slow as 0.01 percent and 0.1 percent. So between 0.01 and 0.1 percent of the budget is spent on translation and accessibility, and translation and access provide 50 percent of the revenue for the for these films. Um, so we're looking at really a situation where there is. Um, an opportunity there for translation and access to be valued much more than they are given the impact that they have on, on the filmmaking industry. Um, now, this means that we have currently, and I'm looking now at a triangle that joins um, the roles of a filmmaker, translator and viewers, but it's a broken triangle because there are, there's a, there are gaps between the filmmaker and the translator, you know, the translator works. And by translator, I mean, those who translate the films or make them accessible. They work um, completely separated, mostly from filmmakers um, with for normally little uh, remuneration and in a short period of time, they have to do their work. And in themselves, the viewers are also quite separated from the translator and from the filmmakers. So this triangle between the filmmaker, translator and the viewers, it's very much broken. Now, when we talk about accessible filmmaking, AFM, we talk about the possibility of considering translation and access during the production of audiovisual media. For that, we need to uh, have the creative team of the film and the translator or whoever makes the film accessible collaborating with a view to making the film accessible to all. And the all means people with and without disabilities, people who may not access the original version of a film because they don't have the linguistic knowledge, uh, they don't speak that language, or they may be deaf or blind or many other issues. Right, so now if we look at how media accessibility is shifting, it's shifting towards three kind of directions. One is from, from inception, which is what I've just talk, talked about, right? Can we have media access and translation as well from the beginning? Second, can we have it for all or is it for all? And let me just dwell on this. Let me just dwell on this idea of for all. Um, until not quite recently, actually, when people talked about media accessibility, they were looking at, well, they were thinking, oh, it's just versions for people who are deaf and blind, right? So let's focus on subtitles for deaf people. Some of the latest standards on subtitles for deaf uh, or intralingual, same language subtitles which in the US you call captions, um, are intended for those who cannot hear or understand the audio content. But actually, explicitly, they're also targeting people watching a movie in a non-native language. So my question to you is, are we talking about translation or are we talking about access here? Or are we dealing with a situation where translation and access somehow overlap as well? Uh, we know that 80% of the people who use subtitles for deaf and hard-of-hearing people um, excuse me, I should have said this. Uh, in Europe, we talk about 
subtitles when they are <laughs> for hearing people, and we talk about subtitles for deaf and hard of hearing people. Whereas in the in the US, you normally talk about captions in the latter case, right? What we now know is that in Europe, 80% of people who use captions are actually not deaf or hard of hearing. And we also know, as you can see here, that 85% of video content on Facebook is watched without sound. And this is because you may be riding, you may be on a bus or public transport, have no chance, no earphones there with you, and then you turn on your subtitles. So those subtitles were meant to be maybe for people with hearing loss, but it may not be the case for whoever is watching it. So we are in a situation where accessibility is being used by all or by many people. My question though is, are filmmakers making films for all? Um, and where, when there are original and accessible versions, are we watching the same film? So let's see, let me, let me give you um, a few pointers there. First, let me just show you a few examples of how we watch original films and how we watch subtitled or captioned films, okay? So first, how we watch original films. Uh, when we watch original films that are not captioned, some of our eye movements are voluntary because we have some tasks, we take on some tasks. For example, if I'm looking at a painting like this one and I track the eyes of the viewers, I may get this map. This is where people are looking at, right? But if I ask them to focus on the material circumstances of the characters in this painting, People may look somewhere else at the clothes. And if I ask them, what's the relationship between these people? They may look at their eyes, as you can see there. So depending on what we're looking for, we vary the way we look at films and paintings. Those are voluntary eye movements. Um, but we also have involuntary eye movements. And that's the so-called illusion of volition, which is, well, some there's some phenomena there that I'd like to talk about. Um, I don't have time to focus on all of them, but let me talk about attentional synchrony. And I'll show you a video where you can see, um, let's see, where you can see the eyes of 15 people, who, which are being tracked around the screen. So you can see their fixations, their eye fixations. Hopefully you'll be able to hear. This is a trailer for Puss in Boots. So you see Puss in Boots and he's going to be walking towards us and this is going to be a shot with other characters. And you'll see how the eyes of the viewers converge mostly on the main character. Uh, there is an attentional synchrony. So if you, if you remember then, if what you've seen is that mostly they are... Okay, let me see. There. We have out of these people, only maybe one person is looking elsewhere at the background. And that's what we normally consider as an outlier in scientific terms, you know, something we rule out. And we focus on the majority of people who are looking at the center of the screen. When we do have a different shot with several characters, here the distribution of attention is different. And we have people looking at the different characters, not so much synchrony there. So, we tend to explore the screen when there are more characters. We focus on the main character when there's just the one and movement attracts us. Yes, faces, eyes, right? Okay. Now, I'd like you to, as I say all these things, I'd like you to think about how this view and patterns change when the film is captioned or subtitled. So let's have a look at what happens when we watch a subtitled film. There's a, generally there's a tidy pattern, which sometimes could be less tidy, but um, where, well, you know, Let's have a look at this video. We start looking at the caption first, then we move up to the center of the screen, looking for the main character, eyes and mouth, and then down to the subtitle, to the caption. Now, do we explore the screen or not? Well, that's the thing. Here's the, bit, the first uh, difference. We don't really have, we don't really know whether we have the time to explore the screen. Let's have a look. Students and employees alike are impeded by a lack of access to spoken information in group settings. Deaf students can't hear the... Did you see that, yeah? So we're looking at a situation where, after reading the subtitle... 
Students and employees alike are impeded by a lack of access to spoken information in group settings. Deaf students. We focus straight onto the characters. Look at one. Look at the other. This one had time. This 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 person had actually time to explore at least two people on the on the shot, but. When we have a, 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 a shot like the previous one where there are several people, um, now, how much time do we have to explore the screen? We may be looking at that shot very differently because we're looking at subtitles and not the original version of the film. Now, I'd like to show you a phenomenon here, which is called subtitling blindness. And this is all about what happens when, because we read a subtitle, we don't have access to the image. Um, this is one of those situations where you know, you can hardly say that you're watching the same film or in the same way as in the original version. Now, think about this, this shot. Um, we have a shot from my short documentary, Joining the Dots. And what we can see, it's a sign on the screen that says, a lovely lady and a grumpy old man live here. This, is, this can be found in the garden of the blind friend with whom I made this film, Trevor. And he was telling me as he was, uh, as I was, filming this, he was telling me, oh, I don't know what's in my garden. I, I just don't venture there. My, my wife knows. Now, he didn't know that he had this sign there. In the film, I show the sign and I put it together with his narration about this. Now, for the original viewers, which is the group for whom I was making the film, I, I wasn't making a film for all. I, I didn't know how to. Um, for these original viewers, there was no, no issue. They could read this as they listened to Trevor's words. Problem is, when I had to subtitle my film into Spanish, then I had to subtitle it like this. And now you can see a very awful shot where you have the same sign, but on the top you have a translation of a sign, and at the bottom you have the translation of Trevor's words. It's not only aesthetically ugly, but it's also very difficult to process. Um, and this is only like this because I just never took into account that whenever you have a first a close-up of a sign or a letter or some words, and you have narration on top of it, the original viewers are going to be okay. But for your foreign viewers, who may be, you know, the biggest chunk of your audience, you're creating a problem there, which you can solve by editing the film in a different way. Another example of how differently we watch original and, and captioned or subtitled versions. Have a look at the, another shot from the same film. So this is a scene where Trevor and myself are... Let's see if I can see this. Yeah. Now. Is if so. Optic nerve. Went now you you see two dots here. One night with a massive headache. The orange dot are people who are watching the film without subtitles, and the blue dot are people who are watching the film with subtitles. Woke up the next morning, terrible pain. So I was taken to Charing Cross. So now you can see me and Trevor sitting in the underground. Uh, and I'd like you to focus on the blue dot, that is, those people who are watching the film with subtitles. And have a look at that as soon as I have a close-up of Trevor's cane and see what happens there. See where the blue dot is. Um, from there, I was taken across to St. George's. And the guy said, look, I was so sorry, he said, but um, you've gone blind in your right eye. Did you see that the blue dot only has time to look at the subtitle, but does not have time to look at the image? Um, those people who are watching the film subtitled in the subtitled version are not able to see that image. When I noticed this, I started asking questions and having questionnaires for those viewers watching the film in the subtitled version. And I noticed that most of them, 90%, missed 20% of the shots in the film because they had been edited like this with short shots, quick images with audio on top of them in a way that the image was not accessible. They were not able, if they were reading the subtitle, they couldn't see the images. So effectively, as I say here, they were watching the same film so differently to the, to, to the original viewers that they might as well be watching different films. Um, so it wasn't a different film, but it was being watched so different that the film in itself became different. Uh, and I think it's just because we, as filmmakers, we tend to consider only the original audience. So again, the triangle, the broken triangle, what do we do about this? Well. To join the filmmaker and the viewers, um, what we suggest is that the filmmakers need to think about the global film. And the global film is the, the original film and all its translated and accessible versions. Can we have filmmakers consider this, you know? Um, through collaboration between translators and filmmakers, 
in big productions, we normally work with directors of accessibility and translation who liaise between the filmmaker and the translators or the uh, access providers. Yeah. So that's what we are pushing for. And, you know, I, I went to Netflix studios in Hollywood and, and gave a workshop about this. And Netflix are beginning to introduce some figures like creative dubbing supervisors who are liaising with filmmakers. So, so some good steps are being taken. Um, but we still have some, some problems. And, and this is the second part of a presentation that I'd like to talk about, which is even if I work with a filmmaker, if I follow the rules and the guides and, and the guidelines, um, so captions and subtitles are limited. I mean, I talk about a, there's a caption here that says explosion, as we can see one, and the audience cheering as a footballer is running. But we, those are sound descriptions for people with hearing loss, but we have no indication of which one is louder than the other. And we have this one where it says, tires screeching and horn honking as there's an, an imminent accident on screen. These are two sounds that are shown one after the other, but we know that when we hear it, both things happen at once. Captions or subtitles are limited because they cannot show difference in volumes or depth or overlapping dialogue. And they, they are forcing us captioners to tell people about things, not to show them, you know, which is the opposite of what film should do. There's too much explanation. Uh, unless we have creative captions and creative subtitles, yeah? So this is what I'd like to, to show you today. There's such thing as creative media accessibility. Well, up until now, it didn't really exist, even in Google. But now there's more and more examples. Um, and there are filmmakers like, like James Spinney and, and, and Pitt Middleton, with whom I've worked on the film Notes on Blindness, who say, Accessibility transcends basic considerations of comprehension and plot, and they be, it becomes an extension of the creative approach to the film. So let me show you some examples, but before that, a definition. What is creative media access? Well, those practices that do not only attempt to provide access for the users of a film or a play, but also seek to become an artistic contribution in their own right, enhancing user experience often and in a creative and imaginative way. So. What examples do we have? I mean, I've just finished this film, for example, yeah, where memory ends. And, and we knew when we were filming it that we wanted to displace our subtitles. So he's Ian Gibson, the biographer of Lorca, is speaking in English. But I knew that, well, I don't want necessarily my, my viewers to be looking at the bottom of the screen for this, for this subtitle to be read. But, you know, why not have Ian on the left-hand side of the screen? And as I'm filming prepare the shoot so that there's some space on the right-hand side for the, for the sub subtitle to be there, yeah? And with a background that matches the color of the bookshelf that's behind there. But there are many more inventive ways of doing this. Have a look at this subtitle, which, let's see. For the film Sherlock. Excuse me. Nameless. I am here to avoid a dire catastrophe. If the concerns of two nations, which shall remain nameless, but I can tell you they speak French and German, are not dealt with tonight, I shall be forced to go to Switzerland to attend a ghastly peace summit in Reichenbach. The worst thing about Switzerland is the altitude. I'm so glad you invited your brother. So as Stephen Fryer's character leaves the screen and keeps talking, the subtitle goes with him and it, 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 it uh, becomes smaller and smaller. And then we have a close-up subtitle of the new conversation. So this, these subtitles, they do have depth. You see, these subtitles have depth. These subtitles show differences in volume, but they show them. They don't tell them. They don't tell us about them. Um, and this is what's interesting about creative media access, that it opens up a new, more visual way, for example, of looking at captions. Um, and that's, that's what I'm interested in, in, in the possibility of, of, of doing that. Or you have an example of BBC subtitles, in this case, captions, which are really creative as well. The British people have spoken. In America, it takes a two-thirds majority in both houses of Congress. It's easy to see why the bar is set so high. Unlike ordinary lawmaking, constitutional changes are for keeps. Voters are fickle, opinions change. We have no right to condemn future generations to abide irrevocably by the transient whims of the present. So as subtitles move and change and disappear, they become very conspicuous. So creative media access, 
or creative audiovisual translation. But here, creative media access could be more or less visible or, or more or less inconspicuous or conspicuous, depending on the attraction, depending on the, 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 the role that they take on, right? Um, here, they, they become protagonists and they reinforce the message. Let me show you an example which I really like from a student of mine. She's only 22 and, and she was looking at how to audio describe and subtitle both things. So can we have one version with audio description and subtitle, only one for all, um, of this short snippet from Disney's fa Fantasia, right? Let's have a look because it's an interesting piece with, I'm, I'm looking at the original version now. Think about what a blind person is missing and what a deaf person is missing when watching this clip, the original version. So we're looking at a situation where we have um, the music on the one hand, we have the images, and the images of fairies kind of dancing almost to the music as the movements go. Um, very difficult to audio describe. Um, and what she's chosen to do is this. So let's have a look. The Nutcracker by Tchaikovsky. The conductor races both his hands and the light draws his back with the silhouette. Little shiny dots fly in the dark of the night, gracefully jumping all the way. Color purple stands out, finds a flower to light with her wand. In a fairy shape. So what we have here, which I think is fantastic, is an example of very creative audio description and creative subtitles. She, see, she describes, but she does it by singing a song that is subtitled in a very creative way. So that now you have movement in the subtitles, you have the, the melody of the of the music and the lyrics, and you wonder whether by the, by doing this you are actually creating almost not full access, but quite thorough um, and holistic access. Um, so it's very interesting. There's no, obviously you wouldn't be able to do this following the standard guidelines on audio description. You have to be much more creative than that. I don't think I can cover more there, but I mean, it's just an example to leave there with you about this kind of sung audio description. Um, now, one thing is when all this is used just for translation, and I've been looking at, at debates about this and people say, well, yeah, when I have to subtitle from one language into another, I could be creative with the subtitles and different fonts and stuff. And the discussions, the theoretical discussions are all about whether it's an original or it's a translation, adaptation. They're very interesting theoretical discussions, but I can't help but think that it's seen as a bonus, as an icing on the cake or as a welcome, but not expected or demanded. Um, addition to the original version. But I think that when we talk about media access and creative media access, well, here there's no sense of urgency, but with creative media access, I think of it as a different way. So let me just, this is where I would situate creative audio, audio visual translation. But now with creative media access, I come to this idea of media access is not just from the beginning now, it's not just for all, but it's also the extent to which it's led by the users. And when I look at the examples of creative media access, the previous one was not made by someone who has a disability, but a lot of uh, disabled artists are now producing audiovisual media and producing access. And when they talk about it, or in disability studies, when they talk about it, they, they, they handle different concepts. They talk about subjectivity, embodiment, a disability lens, and crucially, they talk about inclusion, participation, the fight against ableism, and a much bigger sense of urgency than when you talk about creative translation. So there is something different here. There is an urgency. There is uh, the idea of, of being looking at a wider picture. And I'd like to show you some examples of that. 
Um, so why subjectivity? Well, because most guidelines tell us, describe your images for blind people, for example, as objectively as you can. But we are not objective people. Objective, and only the objects are objective, right? We all have our views. Um, and as Cleach, uh, Cleach says, Georgina, while a scholarly treatment of a text, painting, or film may be scrupulous in sticking to a neutral description, the reader can ascribe the particular word choices to the subjectivity of the author. But with audio description, the illusion of objectivity is reinforced because the description is delivered without authorship, as it represents some unassailable truth. Often blind and deaf people complain about captions and audio description being almost like the voice of God. But that's not the voice of God. It's been done by someone who has some um, subjectivity. So creative media access says abandon objectivity. You know, it's not possible. It's no desired. Just do away with it. Um, and this is what Lisa Silvestre, the artist with whom I've worked, has done in her caption series. She says, well, I'm hard of hearing. I used to go to school. I used to watch films that they showed me with no captions. And I used to take notes of what I could get from those uncaptioned films. What she does is she's created exhibitions with snippets from, you know, clips from films and cartoons where the captions are not showing us what the characters say. The, car the, car the captions are showing us what Lisa tells us about her experience. So here we see uh, an image of a castle and the character, and then she says, the sky still doesn't let me know what time of day it is. Why? Because she's trying to guess, you know, what she cannot guess through other means, looking at the, the sky, what time of day is it? Or here we see two people talking in the foreground and something's happening in the background. Now, I would imagine that most of us are looking here at the foreground where we see a couple and one of them speaking on a phone box, but really what the most important part of the scene is happening here on the, um, on, the, on the kind of background where someone is about to steal the main character's car. Now, I would imagine that if we could eye track this, most of us would be here. But Lisa says in the background, she says in her caption, something's happening. Well, Lisa's here. She is the outlier, remember? She is the one on the, on the margin, the one that we normally discard and rule out in scientific studies. But because she's looking there, she's noticing things that we are not noticing. Um, in this scene on a train, she says, I just realized that none of the characters here are swaying with the movement of the train. And she says, I think IMDB should hire hard of hearing people to catch those trivia bloopers. Well, what she's telling us is, well, because she has no access to audio, then she looks and scrutinizes and gets a lot from the images. A lot. And then she starts describing images. This is something that fascinates me. She smiles knowingly, talking about this character, this face. Then in this house, a scene from a house, she says, their homes have similar colors, she says in her captions. Dark grays and blues and hunter greens with light sources breaking up the dark shapes. We see her through her furniture, which feels intimate. All these captions are describing what she can see. And now my question to you is, don't you think that these captions and the content of them are actually almost like an audio description of the images? So would a deaf person like Lisa, who is all about the images, would she not be a good audio discoverer for blind people? Because that's what she can see. She can describe those images for blind people. Could we not have a blind captioner describing sounds for hard of hearing people? I don't know. I mean, this is, these are things that, and then we have other captions that tell, tell us all about Lisa's experience of exclusion, a window into her experience. She says, sometimes it occurs to me that people have entire relationships through her phone, through their phone, as we see two people on the phone. I haven't been able to hear well enough to talk on one since high school. And I sometimes feel entirely cut off from pop culture. I'm left wondering how to make connections when I don't share the same content. So by using creative media access, creative captions, she gives us a window into her experience of exclusion which we may not know. And she provides us with a dialogue. She talks to us. Normally, captioners use captions to talk to deaf viewers. Here is a deaf viewer who talks to us using captions um, and, and providing almost descriptions, I would say. OK, now, there's also two elements that I'd like to focus on, which are when, and I'm talking about creative media access, as provided in films made by or media access provided by, by 
are mostly artists with disabilities. Um, and concepts like embodiment and disability lens are important. Why? Well, I don't know, sign languages are embodied languages. So if we talk about people with hearing loss, um, I don't know if you can see me now because I don't have images in front of me, but, but you know, we sign and this is important, but our faces are also important. And a lot of signing deaf people to say, you know, it breaks my communication when I have to look down at the bottom of the screen and look for a caption there. So um, in this trailer of, um, about Golodet University, a university by and for deaf people, we can see how the captions are very close to the characters. Hopefully you'll be able to see it now. Just a second. Around here, there's a class, a classroom, and the teacher is talking and look at where the captions are. You see, we see the captions just right by the people who are talking. Captions move and change. We see the front and the back of them as we move around them. So we are with those people, with their faces. The captions are part of the embodied meaning. Uh, and it's all much more, it's all so much closer, right? It, it, it gives us a different experience um, of, it creates a space for those captions, yeah, that is close to to the rest of the, the meaning provided by, by their faces and their movements. That's been made by a deaf director, a deaf filmmaker, who was using what he said, a deaf lens, a disability lens in this case, to film as, as, as he'd like to see films, right? Um, so these are some examples of you know, subjectivity, as Lisa Silvestre, embodiment, disability lens. But then there's also the wider fight for inclusion and participation, right? Um, uh, a scholar, actually a writer, recently said, access is getting through the door. Inclusion is sitting at the table and participation is eating the meal with the rest of people. So this is where we are, you know, a step beyond access here, um, going into inclusion and participation. And also looking at fighting against ableism. Ableism as the more overt or covert or, or unintended discrimination of people with disabilities. Now, this is quote by Daniel I like. She says, many times I feel captions are intended to raise a deaf or hard of hearing person's understanding of sound up to a hearing person's experience. And that feels incredibly limiting to me, precisely because I don't know many hearing people who think about sound as profoundly and as imaginatively as deaf and hard of hearing people. And this is very interesting because we tend to caption, uh, and I train captioners as, okay, describe the sounds that you can hear and a deaf person would not hear. But this is very limiting because first of all, a deaf person can see and let's see how much can they can get from those images. And then the experience of sound that this deaf person has may just be much more than I can't hear anything, much more than that. It's, it's, um, it's much more um, sensorial, it's much more uh, I often talk about, you know, to, to deaf friends who tell me about their experience with the radio, with the radio monitors, when, when they touch, they used to touch the radio as they listened to it and they could feel it vibrate. You know, you know, deaf people go to, um, uh, you know, they dance a lot, they go into nightclubs, they, uh, some filmmakers, for example, are actually using balloons and, and when they have deaf audiences, they give them balloons and they can feel the balloon kind of uh, shaking as there is sound coming from the big screen. So, you know, this is not a very limited um, um, notion of sound where you, we just explain to them what they cannot hear. It, it cannot be just that. So an example of someone who's trying to tell us about it in quite a cheeky way, Kristin Sun Kim, uh, a star. She's a, a sign language user, an artist, and she's made this little film about what if she was to caption... Um, the thing is, this one is impossible to describe because there's no sound here. But she says, well, my relationship with captions is one where I need them a lot, but the person who writes those captions is does not share my view of the world and of sound. So what if I was to make my own captions? And she goes on to make a little film where she produces extremely creative and poetic captions. Let's have a look.
for those who don't have access to visuals, she's talking about how that music will be captioned with just a symbol or the word music. And she goes on to say, well, what if this was described in a different way? And she goes on to give a very, very long and accurate description of that sound or a subjective description of what sa that sound conveys to her. Violin music. She says, that's better, but then why not more? She says it doesn't tell me anything about what that sound is made of. How it moves, its personality. The more descriptions, she says, the better. So for instance, mournful violin music, she says. Or mournful violin music that sounds like crying alone in an empty bar. Or better yet, mournful violin music that sounds like crying alone in an empty bar. to the bartender as you order a fourth martini. Music stops. She says, that tells me something. I place a lot of trust in the people who write captions. But those people have a different relationship with sound and the world than I do. So I started to wonder, what would it, like, what would it look like if I wrote the captions myself? The sound of anticipation intensifies, reads a caption. Let me show you, she says. On a black screen, they begins like the first line of a poem, says the caption. Second caption, the sound of sun entering the bedroom. What we can see is the sky and a room. Caption reads, the sound of eyelids opening. Electricity attempting to find its output. I'm going to fast forward so we can see another part of film where we see what could be the sea or a lake and the sound reflecting on it. And the caption reads, the sound of turning something over inside your head, glitter flirting with my eyeballs. And at the end of the film, just to give you another example, we see a door, a half open door, and the caption reads, whispered conversation. And the next caption reads, words throwing punches. And the next caption reads, the sound of hurt feelings coming over. So what we see in here is, it's a poetic film, and the captions are adding yet another poetic layer. So more poetry added in the captions, in, those, in between those brackets that allow you to fill in those gaps between sound and images. Is she describing sounds or images? Well, maybe a little bit of both. She's, she's adding poetry to it. And sometimes she describes sounds, sometimes images, sometimes she provides us with words that could actually do, to be honest, uh, read in an audio version as an audio description and displayed on the screen, they could also work as captions. For, for deaf people. So I wonder whether poetry, as used here, poetry in media access, is almost like a meeting point between audio description and captions, between the needs of people with hearing loss and those who cannot access the visuals. Um, so we're, we're entering into very interesting, very interesting territory that I hadn't ventured before, just because we're saying, well, uh, let's take off the shackles of, of standard and strict guidelines and let's do whatever we want with captions right which is what she's suggesting and giving up towards the end of the presentation now some of the creative media access provided by people with disabilities uh has this sense of urgency yeah and this is a very notorious one now what i'm going to show you now is i mean there's there's it's more of an activist kind of point of view yeah and as this author says well a lot of us by default have become activists um because you know whereas hearing people hearing people don't have to question their rights they are the ones who are looking at creating history and we deaf people are just pushed to the side being deaf has always been a political thing. I don't know if it will ever stop being political. An example is this one. Dear Hearing World is a poem by Raymond Antrobus, a deaf poet, deaf poet from Jamaica, where he adapts the poem Dear White America into 
uh, a story about you know uh, audio supremacy and the discrimination of their pe deaf people and he, this poem has been turned into a short film where um, a young black woman is signing as she comes out of her flat and she is throwing at us the hearing world in this case at, at me and other hearing peers um, uh, evidence of how discriminated against their, their being so she's using creative captions for this here it is search of sound or orbit. A solar system where the space between a star and a planet isn't empty. I've left Earth in search of an audible God. I do not trust the sound of yours. You would not recognize my grandmother's hallelujah if she had to sign it. You would have made her sit on her hand or hand. Put a ruler in her mouth as if measuring her distance from her. Take your god back. Though his songs are beautiful, they are not loud enough. I want the fate of Lazarus. For every deaf school you've closed. Every deaf child whose confidence has gone to a silent grave. Every BSL user who has seen the annihilation of their language. I want these ghosts to hold your tongue-tied hands. I have left Earth. I am equal parts sick of your own. I'm hard of hearing too. Just because you've been on an aeroplane or suffered head colds. Your voice has always been the loudest sound in a room. I call you out for refusing to acknowledge sign language in classrooms. For assessing deaf students and what they can't say instead of what they can. They did not ask to be part of the hearing world. I can't hear my joints crack, but I can feel them. So. This is an indictment, right? Calling out all these issues of discrimination. Um, before I finish, I wanted to leave you with um, just a commercial. Let me just show you this commercial where I think where, where we can see um, an example that, that will help me wrap up the whole, the whole uh, talk. Um, so if we go here to um, swimming at Toyota, Let's have a look at this ad. In this ad by Toyota, um, we have uh, the story of Jessica Long, who was born with no legs, and then she went on to become a Paralympic champion. Let's have a look at this ad. Um, think, please, about what it conveys to you, and then let's think critically about it as well. Um, I think, yeah, we'll talk about the images in a second. Mrs. Long? Yes? We've found a baby girl for your adoption, but there are some things you need to know. She's in Siberia, and she was born with a rare condition. Her legs will need to be amputated. I know this is difficult to hear. Her life... Be easy, but I can't wait to meet her. We believe there is hope and strength in all of us. Toyota, proud right. partner. Of now, looking at this, this ad, extremely famous, very inspiring. It's helped. You know, a lot of people thought it was the best ad they had ever, had ever seen. And etc. Now, if you look at it from a point of view of critical disability studies, as authors like Liz Jackson had looked into it. They destroy the ad because what they say is, well, first of all, you know, we're looking at a situation where we are portraying disability, but how are we portraying it? First, from the darkness of this hospital where she's born, then obviously the production value is amazing. She keeps running, she, she swings across the scenes, right? Then the next thing that we can see is... Well, Her she's walking, she's beginning to walk with those prosthetic legs, but then straight away we see that mum towards whom she is walking. And we wonder, who is the focus of this ad? Her or the mum? That's the first thing. As we carry on looking at the ad, 
she keeps swimming out of the darkness into the light where she is celebrated by the uh, non-disabled society first a few people then a lot of people and then in the commercial it might not in the living room It'll where her parents are deciding that they're going to go on with this. Now, there's no more darkness. There's a, there's a warm light in this home, real home, not just a house, a home. But the focus, look at the focus of this shot. We can see mom and dad happy. And then on the bottom right corner, that's the person, that, in this case, the disabled um, athlete. But she's not the focus. So what Liz Jackson says is, who is this film, this, this, this commercial made by and for? And what are, what is the role of the of the disabled person here? Is it to make us non-disabled people feel better? Um, does the disabled person have a voice here? And then another question, which is very interesting, and this was said to me by a disabled friend of mine, who who also has um, ha had her legs amputated, and she said, "Well, all that is true, Pablo, but you don't know how that makes me feel watching this ad because I'm never." I mean, I, I have a similar issue as she does. I'm in a similar situation, but I'm never going to win a gold medal. Um, this is notion of the, as said in disability studies, super creep. We, when we make films about disabled people, we tend to turn them into super men and super women, you know, which only causes more damage to other people with disabilities. So why am I showing this? Um, because just because the world and films are made by disabled people, uh, by non-disabled people. And um, we, we put ramps on those films, which is our accessibility. And we tend to put the same ramp for every film because we follow guidelines. Now with accessible filmmaking, I thought, you know, I was helping because I thought, well, what if those who made accessibility are in contact with filmmakers? That's a good thing. Maybe those ramps could be, you know, more creative, more, um, not the same ramp for every film, but for every you know for every film for every building but adapting to the film to the building but of course the question is but who is making those films so just to finish my presentation then uh if i can get to the very end um if we go back to what we were saying the world in media access is, is shifting it's in a state of flux where we're hoping that media access and translation are done from the beginning they're for all hopefully for all yes yes uh, but are they by all? Um, that's the question. There's this disability slogan that's always been nothing about us without us. And it makes me wonder, as a trainer and researcher in media access, how much about people with disabilities have I done without people with disabilities, you know, and um, how this is changing now and how that is going to change media access. So the world and the, the world would look different. And the ad, this commercial, I bet it would look very different if it had been made by people with disabilities. Of course, this is a complex issue because you may have uh, many deaf and blind people who may not consider that deafness, blindness is disability. But I think we are in need of looking at these issues from a different perspective. Um, and um, just to finish then, we may be navigating, all of us using the same access services, you know, and we may be navigating the same mediascape and using the same access services because we all use captions maybe, but I don't think we're all in the same boat. Yeah, I think this is important to remember. Um, you know, in this case, blind and deaf people are not in the same boat. They are not, they're living in a world that's not, that's not made for or by them. So here's hoping that the use of creativity in media access can soon be adopted widely uh, not just as a bonus, as I said before, but as a necessary step in a path towards a more equal and just society. We're just, I guess, beginning this, and, and uh, Maria Jose has pointed me towards um, very interesting resources by someone called is it Thomas Reid, where who has a um, who has a podcast about how to shift the way audio description is being done. So I can see how in different countries people are, are in kind of waking up and 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 promoting, fostering a different way of doing media access. And I think this is the way we should pursue because creative media access then becomes the language that uh, people like me can speak, can use to speak to uh, disability studies and to filmmakers um, to see things from a different perspective. If anyone is interested in reading more about this, I've uh, written a book and a guide 
for those of you who don't want to read a book. There's a, a guide online about all these things and some articles, but I'm looking forward to discovering more and reading um, from some of you. So anyway, um, it's a pleasure and I'm looking forward to some questions and, and answers with you. Thank you so much, Pablo. Uh, this has been truly fascinating and so stimulating at so many different levels. I have the feeling when, whenever I read one of your articles or your works, I have like thousands of words and thoughts that I want to share. And uh, I'm sure that people in the audience feel the same way uh, because of the comments that I am receiving. Um, I have a question, but I want to give the, the opportunity to my students first, if they have some questions or comments that they want to share or anyone, professors, colleagues, and if not, I will post mine. Uh, Kino. Yeah. Um, Professor Romero, thank you very much. And really you blow my mind and I'm sure like uh, for most of us, it's amazing. And um, I am a filmmaker too. And uh, um, it's hard to film thinking in like uh, accessibility and think about like um, in inclusion for everyone. And uh, so I am wondering like uh, if you have some like a tips to, uh, to mm. for, for do this. Yeah. It's it that's a that's a big question, uh, Walter. Walter is Walter, right? Um, a big question. I've tried to put um, most of that information in the book and then in the guide, so that I have some tips there. The guide is freely available online for anyone. Um, so you know, I'll, uh, here's my here's my email in the chat as well, um, and. Um, and on our website, uh, the research group, we have a kind of a, a questionnaire, you know, not a questionnaire, even a form. You fill in three things and then we send you the guide so that we can track who's using it around the world. Because when we talk to companies, they always say, oh, but nobody's doing this, but we want to show that some people are doing it. Um, and how do you do it? I think you do it by changing your mindset, by really thinking about, um, you know, not just the original viewers who are watching the clean version with no captions and, you know, but, it just becomes, at the beginning, it looks like it's going to be a constraint, but then it becomes an artistic uh, opportunity. Because when a filmmaker starts thinking about the description of his film or her film, you know, they've never seen the film through that lens. And, and uh, okay, let me just see uh, an example. How do I caption uh, a music, right? It, we've, we've gone to this really, really odd situation where a captioner, by himself or herself in a room on in, over two days has to decide how to describe that piece of music, right? And then they come up with a description, um, suspenseful or mournful music. But those adjectives that as a captioner I'm looking for, surely they have been said by the filmmaker during, during pre-production to the music composer. The filmmaker said, I like a music that is actually this and that, you know, and they use some adjectives. Why? So we went from adjectives set to the filmmaker, to the music composer, to the music, and then the captioner turns that into, into adjectives. We're, we're going crazy here. Why don't we access the filmmaker and those initial words? Um, and then those are the ones we use. So if we work together, then... Um, we don't even have rules. I can't give you rules because that, that's the whole point. Media access, as done traditionally, is full of rules. And I turn my students into technicians. I've noticed that. They're technicians applying rules. And rule number one and two and three. And if I have Tom and Peter as my students, they will get a 10 out of 10 if they apply the rules correctly. That is, if they become the same person and there's no difference between Tom and Pete, uh, or whatever names I said. Now, if we let them free from those guidelines, and we let them work with filmmakers. Then they come up with creative solutions. And they may get a 10 out of 10, but Tom is doing subtitles in the style of Tom and Pete in Pete's style. And then we actually have captioners who have styles and filmmakers who search for a particular captioner because they have a particular style, which is the reason why I would hire, I don't know, a director of photography. Christensen Kim says, I choose, I hire, I cast my uh, sign language interpreters because they are my face to the world, right? And I would imagine, she says, a world where I could actually choose my captioner because for this film, I want a poetic captioner. So Walter, to ask, answer your question, we don't have rules. We have some principles, some steps, some tips, and I can give them in the guide. But then 
the sky is the limit because when we work with the filmmakers, they come up with all sorts of creative solutions, which then gives us more and more options. Uh, and in our toolbox, then suddenly we have all these options. So we have a few tips, no guidelines, no hard and fast rules, and a lot of things to experiment with. But it's not a limitation. It's um, you know thinking about how uh, someone would access. You know, it's so rich. Your the the sound of your film in a way, and the image in your film in a way. It's just it's just it should be taught in film school. That's what I think. Thank you so much, Pablo. I don't know if there is a question or comment in the YouTube channel, but if not, I'm gonna pose my question because um, Pablo, you made me think uh, made me think about your own documentary because there you are the filmmaker and you are the accessible accessibility advocate. So I would like to know a little bit more about the process that was in your documentary, uh, Donde Acaba la Memoria, where memory ends, that has just been released. What issues came up? I guess they were easy to solve because you were there, you were the filmmaker, so you have access yeah, to- Yeah, but, but you forget, Maria Jose, you forget, you see, I mean, I, I had previous experience with a short film that I completely, you know, like I made a mess of because I was not doing it accessible. That's why I thought, oh my God, you know, I have to get my act together. Uh, for this film, I thought, okay, you know, uh, Ian, the biographer, uh, he's Irish and he lives in Spain. He speaks in Spanish when he pleases, English when he pleases. So I knew that there was not going to be an, unsubtitled or uncaptioned version because for one audience or the other there were going to be captions and subtitles so when i was filming for example i was speaking to the director of photography and she was saying oh close up now close up. this was a documentary right so you improvise a close up now great and i thought martina not so tight we can't have this close up because this scene is going to be captioned for some viewers at least and then the caption is going to be right over the mouth of ian now that's going to be ugly aesthetically speaking and for deaf people, it's going to prevent them from reading lips. So Martina was like, oh, okay, you and your accessible thing, oh, fine. So then we would open up the, the shot a little bit. Uh, when we were composing the shots, whenever we could, because again, this is documentary, then we were thinking where our captions would be. And sometimes thinking about audio description. Um, and when describing the music, the process was beautiful because I, I never done this before, but I hired some music composers who were great. And they said, okay, what music do you want for the film? And I said, how would I know? And they said, give me adjectives. And I gave them adjectives. Um, and they created the music, uh, you know. And in, in some captioning classes that I had in Brussels the other day, I showed people the music with no images. And I, tell, and, and I told them, give me adjectives about the music, you know. And some of the adjectives coincided, which was beautiful, across languages and cultures. And those are the ones that you can have in the captions as well, you know. So everything is related in a way. So if you teach access to, uh, you know, like the diff different professors from different stages of the filmmaking process, I bet each and every one will find things that resonate with what they do, you know, to an extent that it becomes an intersectional, transversal, you know, um, issue that could be mentioned across the different elements of a filmmaking school and dealt with properly at the beginning, uh, I would imagine. And I'm not answering questions, I'm giving speeches, sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. And still, did you find or did you encounter difficulties in what you mentioned, subtitling blindness? For example, in that documentary, yeah. did you find some scenes where you have yeah. on a screen and people talking at the mm. same time mm. and you have to, the conflict about the subtitling? And the pop, you did? You, you encountered yeah, yeah. that? Yeah, I did. Um, I had a big scene where there's a, there's, a, there's a cliff, a massive cliff, and you can see tiny Ian Gibson, the, the character, who just decided, told me, Pablo, I have to climb that cliff. And I said, no, don't do it. You're 75. Still, he wanted to do it, risking his life. And he was so small in the white shot. And the caption was at the very bottom. Those people who were reading the caption could not locate him on the screen. I had no option but to actually display the caption towards him so that I could, I could guide people's eyes towards Ian. Otherwise, he wouldn't be seen. So all these things you're constantly grappling with. And to be honest, Sometimes you actually, uh, for, for the short film, for example, um, because I had to extend some shots to allow for audio description, my audio described version was longer uh, than the original version, you know? But I mean, I thought it's my film. I can do this. No, but, but um, so yes, you know, you're constantly thinking. There's one more element to be constantly thinking about. But in this case, it's easy because you are the filmmaker, sort of. I mean, mm. if not, 
what you have is you need a director of access, yeah, who's going to liaise with you. And now we have to convey this to our students, say, well, up until now, in your uh, when you work on media access as an afterthought and in your isolation, you decide. You decide for things for which you're not really qualified, but you decide. Um, now with filmmakers, you talk to them, you negotiate, but they have the final say. So often they might choose something that you don't like, but you know that's that's part of the filmmaking process. So um, yeah. Are you seeing progress in the figure of this director of access? Is something that companies are starting to think of streaming platforms or distribution film companies? Hey. I've tried, Maria Jose, really hard with big companies, big players like Netflix, but, you know, and, and, and some of it has had some impact, like, like this creative dubbing and supervisors, like, but these are, I mean, these are massive, massive corporations. Uh, they are beginning to put some steps in between the filmmaker and, uh, you know, some links and the translators. So that's looking good. Um, but to be honest, over the past two years, I've been doing this since 2013, over the past two years, I've, I've come to realize that I am it's more effective to actually start from the bottom, grassroots level. Um, for example, if I have a university where I teach students how to make films and I teach um, students, other students in a different degree, how to make films accessible, link them and start working together because then they come, they grow up and they become professionals and they actually value access from the beginning. So working with independent filmmakers, with trainees, with, you know, it's just for the, they, they, for them is the, the normal order of things is access, of course, from the beginning, you know, that's easier than trying to get to Netflix, change things because, you know, so big. So it's our role to be advocates from this from the beginning, but from the training element and in film festivals. I go to a lot of film festivals to just, you know, give the speeches and, and then filmmakers come and say, oh, I've got this film and how can I subtitle it? And, you know, they don't, sometimes they told me, you know, one of them told me, but Pablo, do I not have to follow the guidelines? As in, will I go to prison if I don't? And I say, well, no, it's just, you know, it's, it's not a law. You have to provide captions, but you don't have to follow those, those rules, right? So not any more than you would follow any rule to make a film. So I think I'm, I'm having more fun working with those filmmakers and with the students than I'm, you know, it was fun to go to Hollywood, but, but you don't get too many things there. Thank you. Good advice. We have a question. Uh, Richard raised his hand. Richard, and then Claudia. Professor, prof uh, good evening, everyone. Professor Romero, thank you very much. Such an, such an incredible presentation. Very welcome. High opening. Thank you. Um, you kind of answer my questions because I had two. One was related because this eternal discussion between compliance and conformance when we're talking yeah. about the guidelines. Uh, do you know exactly what countries are, are making this illegal? I mean, I create, are creating legal consequences for companies who do not comply with the guidelines or it's just a matter of conformance when it depends on the industry to regulate itself. That was the first one. And the second one, Sorry, course, Richard, you're saying countries where this creative uh, access may, may become illegal, not legal. Uh, actually, exactly. If they do not comply, if they don't okay, follow the okay, guidelines, okay. Okay. Is it? I mean, they're gonna they're gonna face legal consequences. Okay. Okay. And of course, the second one was just about what you just said about the um, film festivals. Are they raising the bar, or they are just one more time waiting for the industry to regulate itself? Oh, what a difficult question, Richard. Good and difficult questions. Um, I can about the legal aspects. I'm never very good at that. I know that um, what's written in the Spanish. I don't know. For example, now I need to get. Uh, I need to get my film. You know, some funding for the film for the distribution process, right? Um, and there's this in in my region. There's this funds uh, for distribution, and you get so much if you tick some boxes. And some of the boxes is provide captions, right? As per the Spanish guidelines, it says. Now, believe me, Richard, that. If I provide creative subtitles, as I have already for my film, nobody's going to tell me anything. The film is subtitled. It's accessible for people with hearing loss. I can vouch for the access that it provides. Nobody's going to be chasing me or legally or anything. Not at all. Not at all. I don't know what would happen in, the, in other countries. Um, but, I mean, the box that they ask us to tick is, you know, provide captions. That's it. I know there are some rules and stuff, but... 
I don't know. I think, to be honest, Richard, I would say that the problem at the moment with creative captions, depending on how they are displayed, is more technological than anything else. Because if I want closed captions, captions that I activate or disactivate, yeah, then I cannot afford to do some certain creative things that I've shown you in these films. Because those were open captions. So every, you know, so, so, so that means that um, at the moment, for example, I have two versions of two video versions of my film. One is uh, creative captions in one language and then the other ones in the other because they are embedded, they are pasted on the screen, right? Um, so if I was to sell my film to Netflix, then I couldn't have just one image version of the film and then captions on top. I would have different video files, you know, and they don't like that too much. And that's happened with other films. So that technological barrier, we have to fight against somehow. But the legal barrier, I've never come across. I think legally we're looking at, do you provide captions or not? Do you provide audio description or not? And I haven't come across more impediments than that. And the second question was about, Richard? The film festivals, if oh, yeah. they are actually, you know, raising the bar. Are you talking about normal film festivals or film festivals about disability? Um, in general, in general, film festivals. Film festivals in general, I, I know. I think it's us who has to who have to make noise there. You know, they yes, they do provide access sometimes, but not much. They provide mostly translation, sometimes access for hearing people with hearing loss, a little for audio description. Um, so, but you know what? I think that in in environments where access is not there yet sometimes paradoxically it's easier to start providing creative media access because say in Uruguay for example as opposed to the UK who has a long tradition of access the UK has a long tradition of access but that means a long tradition of traditional access and that's difficult to change in Uruguay for example with whom I'm working a lot they've started late but uh, we already pushed for some things from the beginning like for example okay if you wanted to have look, those funds um, for, to make your film, you have to make your film accessible from the beginning. And so they give you the money in the pre-production stage, which is great because then you start thinking <coughs> about access in the pre-production stage and that becomes completely different. So countries and environments where access is younger are sometimes more, you know, they lend themselves better because there's not a big, big, big tradition that you have to break. So that's interesting. And in any case, if you want to learn more about this, definitely look at creative media access in theatre in the UK. Because theatre is a closer environment where you are in touch with the audience and with the directors and, and deaf and blind film direct, um, theatre directors are doing all sorts of really interesting things about this. Um, and they don't care much about the legal thing. They have no problems there. Uh, and the users are super happy. So that's an interesting thing. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, Claudia? Yes, hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for all this knowledge and information. No problem, um, Claudia. I am, I'm impressed that 80% of people who are, are used of titles are actually not deaf or mm. hard of hearing. I mm. think in my personal opinion, that percentage is really high. And I'm wondering, um, I guess a comment and, and a question. First of all, I'm wondering if, like, if I can make a difference, like, tell filmmakers, listen, you know, 80% of people that don't even, that are not even deaf, use of titles, <laughs> okay? Um, and how impressive that is, um, that we can perhaps make those statistics known, perhaps they know them. But if 80% of people that are not even deaf of hearing use them, can you imagine you know, how much more the people that are deaf or blind, you know, could actually use the services. And I'm yes. wondering, you know, and I'm wondering, um, is there like a study that also shows why people, uh, the percentage yeah. is so high, yeah. even from people that don't, are not? Deaf, yeah, good know? question. Well, you see, um, a lot of that comes from Ofcom in the UK, which they notice about this, no captions being used or subtitles for deaf and hard of hearing being used by so many people. Now, it depends on the amount of migrants in a, in a country because you may need those captions to learn the language. Mm -hmm. um, uh, people who um, need to watch those TV sets or whatever computers uh, with no sound because they're in a pub, in a hospital, mm -hmm. public transport. But you see, this is, this is now embedded into the fabric of society because see, a friend of mine called Finn, he works at the UK parliament and, and he makes videos for the Labour Party. 
And from the beginning, they told him, always caption, always caption your videos. Because, you know, you, you don't know, but people watch them with no sound everywhere, you know, in busy streets and stuff. So captions are now a staple element. My problem here is, as they become for all, um, and we, we have pushed for this. I went to, you know, I, I showed my Joining the Dots documentary to Netflix and I pushed for accessibility in Netflix with my students when there was none. And one of my students was the first one to, to add audio description there. So, you know, that was successful. And, and the argument was, it's not a minority, it's a lot of people who use captions. But as we do this, we enter a territory with a different danger. Some people in disability studies say, for all is great, but as you do for all, then our identity is becoming it becomes erased and our needs and priorities also. So there's a risk that by impressing upon people the idea that captions are used by non by, by hearing people, then captions are there to prioritize in the need of the hearing people. Which means that a lot of people are beginning to just use captions with no descriptions of sounds, that is subtitles, and that's that, because they're good for everyone. But then the deaf person is saying, where are my descriptions of sounds here? I just have a transcription. That's not, I need description of sounds and things. So because we are prioritizing the use of the, the, the needs of the other all, which are the privileged all. So I am with you and I think we have to keep fighting for that. But at the same time, let's not lose sight of the fact that we're not all in the same boat. I may not have access to sound in a pub and I may need the subtitles, but as soon as I get back home, you know, I'm a human person who can turn on the sound. So my needs are different. So it's a difficult thing to negotiate. Yes, for all, but at the same time, let's let's acknowledge that there is a an experience of disability there, that we're still fighting. To, you know, we're, st we're still fighting to 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 not have discrimination against it. So those things are important. So I, I said to my to one of my students the other day, I feel stupid talking about this dear hearing world, the clip, and talking about the creative subtitles. Who cares about? That's the least important part of a clip. And, and I said, it's like talking about the, the shoes of a soldier when he goes to war. And she told me, well, yes, but the soldier needs the shoes. So creative media access is just, you know, the element that is being used, but to talk about a wider thing. And the wider thing may be the fact that by privileging this idea of, of media access for all, maybe we are we're in, at risk of discriminating the needs of those who really need it. So yes, the 80%, we have to keep repeating it, but bearing in mind this other element, I think. Thank you so much. That was very, uh, very thorough. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Pablo. I think uh, we are going to close the Q&A. There are no more questions or comments. I don't know. I've, you... I've not been able to follow the ones on the chat, Maria Jose. Uh, the, the, I think there was one. In the chat, or the, in the, Zoom in the chat there's chat. something about uh, the Zoom chat, sorry. Do you want me to read one? Uh, there's one here about fast space scenes. I don't know if you want to oh, read really? it. Oh, really? I thought it was a comment, but if there is a question, go ahead, Pablo, yeah. How would fast space scenes in action movies work with creative captions? Also, can subjective captioning for music become a problem uh, because music can be interpreted in different ways? Um, yeah, one of my PhD students is actually um, working on creative captions and, and she chose action films and she was not very happy because it becomes a little bit tricky. With creative captions, one has to think about the extent to which they give you access or they may distract you as well. So these elements have to be thought about and um, you normally need a little bit of space, but you know, I've just shown you some examples. There's so many other ways of creating creative captions. Sometimes, by the way, don't forget, some filmmakers ask us to be creative, but to be inconspicuous, invisible. So all they want is captions that, for example, I don't know, if the font that better goes with the film is a particular font, they want us to analyze that font and choose a particular font, not the usual captioning font, right? Um, so that and a slight displacement of the subtitle may be super subtle. And that's all they want for the film. They want the caption not to attract attention. And paradoxically, they say, if I follow the guidelines, white captions at the bottom of the screen with an ugly font, so to speak, that actually attracts attention. They say, yeah, if I want to be completely invisible and subtle, then I want creative captions that are subtle. So let's look for a font that, for example, is in line with the rest of the font that I'm using in the film. In my documentary, if I have a caption that says Pablo Romero, whatever, um, then that's the font I'm using. And I've designed it with someone, right? So do I want my caption to look like that, for example? Maybe I do. 
because there's the typographic identity of the film. So, you know, there's there's many, many different ways, whether action or not, on how to be creative. Um, and there's different ways of being more or less uh, conspicuous or visible. And I don't think, I don't think there are more, I'm just scanning through. No, probably not, Maria Jose. Probably not. Yeah, I think these are, yeah, that's, those are comments from the students, but oh, questions. And Kino says that there is no question in the YouTube chat either. Is that okay? Is that all right, Kino? Am I wrong? Yeah, there is no questions on YouTube, and we can stay here talking and talking and listening. Yeah, I was just going to say uh, to say one more thing because Pablo, I was thinking about the creativity yeah. issue. It's a very short question, and mm -hmm. how much creativity can you incorporate? And you just answer like sometimes it's going to be maybe maybe a subtle font or a font that it's in accordance with the typography of the documentary. Yes. But how much creativity is also given by the director, sort of, right? It is, and the great thing about it is that till now, media access and translators, media access people and translators were coming from, um, how do you call it, um, the world of words, so to speak, not of, not of images. So I was training my translation and interpreting students, um, and it was not only until I created a, an MA, a master's in accessible for making, and I brought filmmakers and media access people together in the same class that they became interacting and the interesting thing is that then they came from different worlds and with different ideas and then that's where creativity was sparked so short film uh, a woman and a man train platform they start talking they fall in love they, they have to go uh, the captions with the filmmaker which we made i made uh, well actually it wasn't me it was it was josh branson one of my phd students um and he he made the captions and then the filmmaker says do we have some colors here to identify the characters as we do in in europe this color for the main character this color for the girl fine and when we had everything there the filmmaker said as they are warming up to one another why don't we warm up the colors so it becomes a warmer type of yellow and a warmer type of whatever other color. And I was thinking, my God, you know, 20 years working in captioning and I never thought of this. But I've never thought of this because I was thinking of words. I was never thinking of images and much less was I thinking of subtitles as images. But of course he was. So it's just, you know, the coming together of these two worlds that right. sparks creativity. The dialogue that you mentioned, right? Mm, yeah, absolutely. Bidirectional, not unidirectional. Bidirectional, but then the only thing that's missing there, Maria Jose, is the third element, which is also with the viewers who are also deaf or blind or other, you know, because, you know, when it becomes not just us talking to them and making our things accessible to them, but actually them co-creating, being what, what we said, access is also, you know, it needs participation and inclusion. So them co-creating access and co-creating the films. That's when we have the full, you know, a, a very rich picture. The by the preposition by. <laughs> yes, <laughs> for all and by all. Yes, yes. For all and by all, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Pablo. You have been more than generous. Um, no problem at all. It's been fun. Thank you, everybody, for staying up until the end. This is, has been so fascinating and stimulating intellectually, personally, at all levels. And I wanted to thank you again for being here. Um, I hope that you have uh, all of these ideas and activities in my class to continue with the accessibility and audio description. And <laughs> we, can, we can continue collaborating in this uh, fascinating enterprise.